Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next Enterprise Data World session, Case Study in Data Quality and Information Analysis, which will pre be presented by Michael Schofield and Loma Linda University. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A on the right of the screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please note that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome, Michael. Oh, good uh, morning uh, to people in California and good afternoon to people in Boston. I uh, hope you can see my second slide. Uh, this is a little bit about my background, and that's my official pho photograph uh, with the School of Nursing where I co-teach. Um, and uh, I, my bachelor's was in physics, and my MBA was from UCLA a long time ago. I've been on the speaking circuit in data management for about 23 years, and very fortunate to uh, uh, have the uh, opportunity to speak all over the country and twice in Australia and seven times in London. I get to go to museums and somebody else pays the airfare. I've been using this model, the data to understanding supply chain that starts with reality and then facts and data describing reality, which we convert into information. Uh, that information can be expressed as John Ladley uh, pointed out, and he wouldn't use these words, not all expression effectively communicates. And that communication isn't really uh, uh, complete until there is understanding of the meaning in the mind of the audience or the intended listener or reader or something like that. So facts and data are observations of reality and the kinds of observations that we have in public health include the human senses and devices like uh, clinical thermometers in the lab and blood that gives us blood contents and things like that. And that's uh, the subject of raw data quality, which I will not go into uh, today. Uh, that's a whole hour topic. Actually, it's a three hour workshop. Uh, in the pandemic, the discrete events uh, that we observe are tests and deaths and hospital admissions and things, things like that. There's also patients' lingering symptoms, which we are going to talk about later. Raw data to information requires relations, aggregates, uh, ratios, rate of change, and things like that. And one of the in COVID-19 is when you're looking at a state total for any particular day, you got to ask, did all the counties report this morning? Or are we understating what's really going on in the state? Uh, and so this is information quality, which is different than raw data quality. Another one hour topic. I eat uh, lunch in the hospital across the street from the School of Nursing with my friends. And I saw this t-shirt come through the checkout line that says, without a clinical lab, you're only guessing. I like that. They're basically a message to some of the physicians who diagnose more intuitively. Now, a couple disclaimers. I have no formal certification in epidemiology or virology. I'm not a physician, and I'm kind of a neophyte in mathematical statistics. But for a while, I worked at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases and learned a lot about viruses there. I've been in the data management space for 30 years and particularly in data quality assessment for 25 years. And this topic is a moving target. It changes over time, but good science is that way. Uh, always discovering something new to improve our understanding. And a lot of people uh, in America don't understand that science is going to get smarter. And so the message may change. And I reserve the right to be smarter and better informed tomorrow than I am today. Now, uh, we have had some experience with the 1918 flu. It came in multiple waves. We're seeing that today. It mutated over time. 
it killed selected age groups, children under 10, very different from today. Uh, 3% uh, of all factory workers in the U.S. died. 6% of all coal miners or miners were, uh, were killed, but it barely touched the elderly. Very different characteristics than what we're dealing with today. But uh, one, one characteristic in common is the more people are infected, the more opportunities the virus has to mutate into something more deadly. Now, put, to put this all into context, uh, the Spanish flu in America killed about uh, 679,000. World War II, all the American deaths only amounted to 419,000. But with COVID-19, we're up to, uh, well, uh, 569,000 was what I saw this morning. So uh, we're already 130,000 more dead in America due to COVID-19 than uh, were killed in World War II. To put this in an international context, the United States has 4.2% of the world population. Back in February, we had 20% of the world's deaths. Um, and uh, uh, we, it's about the same today because Mexico and Brazil and India are seeing a, a large uh, growth in, in deaths. Now, I know people who think that this is a hoax. The, the whole pandemic is just a hoax. And the New York City Department of Public Health uh, conducted a, a study for a 52-day period uh, where they uh, counted 32,000 deaths. Now, they, are, they know their territory and they know their seasonally expected number of deaths, their baseline for that same 52-day period uh, was only 7,900, which meant that they had 24,000 deaths over baseline. And 57% uh, uh, of those were laboratory-confirmed COVID-19. Others, by basis of the symptoms, were uh, probable COVID-19, and another 22% needed further study. So this kind of puts a lie to this, the uh, propaganda that it's all a hoax. Uh, they had to bring in extra trailers, uh, refrigerated trailers, to uh, hold all the bodies. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, we got this chart from the CDC. Uh, giving us the total situation in uh, the United States uh, during uh, the calendar year 2020. And so the baseline for all causes of deaths is relatively flat. It goes down a little bit uh, when you get into the spring and summer. And so the number of deaths in excess of the baseline uh, is very visible in this chart. The COVID-19 first spike, particularly in New York State, was there in April, and then it started to go up after Thanksgiving. Uh, so COVID-19 is now considered the third largest cause of death, at least in 2020. Right uh, in January and February, it was the largest or the, the most frequent cause of death in the United States. Now, uh, these... Uh, uh, charts of uh, uh, the uh, number of cases and the number of deaths uh, here in the United States total. Uh, the solid line is the seven-day moving average. I find that much more useful than to see the volatility of the weekly and uh, reporting and the non-reporting over weekends. In California, as of March 31, this is what the shape was. So we were really hammered with deaths after the holiday season. And as you can see, there's a bit of a lag between the peak of the deaths and the peak of the cases uh, of infections. So that's, that's important to know. The deaths will not appear immediately as a metric. Uh, looking again at this internationally, South Korea has two, had 2.8 deaths per 100,000 people, while the United States death rate per capita is 51 times that of South Korea. 
So at that rate, if the U.S. had responded, if the government and the authorities had responded as effectively as the South Korean government did, there would be today maybe 12 or 13,000 Americans who would be dead, not 550,000. But to uh, the, the South Korea culture is different than the American political uh, landscape. So uh, more useful uh, metric than just the number of cases is the morbidity. If infected, what are the odds of death? And currently, as of this morning, it's 1.78% of all people who are infected die. Uh, if the infections are undercounted, and this is one of the uh, vicissitudes of the uh, statistics here, if the infections are undercounted, then the denominator is larger and the death rate would go down. But as of this morning, using this morning's numbers, this is where we get to the 1.78% uh, infection. The, uh, it was 1.81 a month ago, and it's 2.11 worldwide. And the reason for that is that much of the world does not have as good a uh, acute care health hospital system as does the United States. But that figure is really too simplistic because the actual death rate may differ for subsections of the population. So uh, morbidity varies by subgroup. It varies by gender, ethnicity, age brackets, and if the person has any latent health issues like diabetes, uh, or obesity, hypertension. So if we were to publish statistics, we, we'd we have to expand uh, that 1.81, that was last month's, uh, we would have to be more specific by gender and by ethnicity or by gender and uh, pre-existing condition, diabetes, cancer, obesity, or something like that. Now, uh, there, there were some who said that COVID-19 was no more deadly than the seasonal flu. Well, uh, the, the statistics don't bear that out. It's actually about 20 times more deadly than the seasonal flu. Now, the World Health Organization estimated 3 to 4%, but that's over the entire world with uh, many countries uh, having uh, uh, less of a, uh, a health, uh, a lesser quality uh, response in, in terms of health care. Uh, this Lancet uh, publication uh, from the UK said if infected seniors have a 5.6% odds of dying, where 20 to 49 have a very low chance of death. It's still there. Uh, Minnesota Public Health gave us a histogram of uh, the total number of cases. Now, this is cases, not deaths. Uh, and... Uh, by age bracket, five-year age bracket. And, and so the highest infection rate, not death, but infection rate is with 20 to 30-year-old uh, people. Well, are they reckless and responsible? The ones I see sure, surely are, but they're also more active in the economy, particularly in uh, interfacing with customers. Now, this very gratuitous photograph is of me donating blood. And I do this every 56 days. Uh, they love to see me coming because my blood type is O negative, CMV negative. And uh, uh, what does CMV negative mean? It ha I have no antibodies to the cytomegalovirus. I have not been exposed and my immune system did not develop antibodies and they don't want those antibodies in blood that they give to low weight newborns. So uh, I have to fill out a questionnaire about my behavior and my health history before I can go in and they stick the needle in and it hurts. It's a big needle. But uh, they also, before they use my blood, they test for all these uh, conditions and diseases before they can put it into the uh, it, uh, the pool to use on ro uh, real live patients. Now, what is a virus? It's a protein shell surrounding some genetic material, DNA or RNA, 
but it is not alive. And this is, uh, our language sometimes belies this. It cannot reproduce or divide. It requires a living cell to replicate itself, and then it kills the cell. So the virus would enter the membrane of the cell into the cytoplasm. Uh, it the, uh, the protein shell around the virus dissolves. It releases the genetic material, which combines with the genetic material in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and it expels one or more, uh, shall we say, daughter virons, and then the cell dies. So this is how the virus replicates. Got to talk about antibodies. Antibodies are created by the amazing human that uh, detect, it detects this invas invasive pathogen of bacteria or virus and uh, uh, creates a, uh, a, 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 some proteins that attack it. So for every specific kind of virus, uh, there, uh, the immune system develops an antibody to attack and eliminate that virus. And sometimes we see the antibodies in a blood test and the virus is gone. So that tells us that the, uh, uh, the person had been infected with a particular virus and the antibodies basically eliminated it from the bloodstream, but the antibodies are still there. And so that's, that's an important uh, way to measure. Now, a typical life cycle, someone gets the, uh, the COVID-19 and they may get sick and there's some delay before they show symptoms, or they may get sick and die. And uh, like I said, that's 1.8% of infections. Or they may not show any symptoms at all. And this occurs in, in some uh, younger people and it actually, it actually deludes them into thinking they're invulnerable. Now, uh, in the period of time before they show symptoms, they're pre-symptomatic, uh, but still contagious. We have a, a test uh, that that's where we put the swab up the nose. Uh, the victim doesn't know they have the virus unless they get tested. And so they're contagious and can spread. That's why we want the face mask. So up until the time that symptoms are visible, we use the antigen test. After symptoms are visible, we use the antibody tests. Uh, we use blood tests to detect the antibodies. Once they have the antibodies, are they immune uh, from further infection? That uh, That's still being studied. Uh, uh, the Imperial College of London study said perhaps 90%, but otherwise these people could get reinfected. Uh, and so a secondary infection, it has happened. We don't know why the antibodies didn't attack the secondary infection or had they just faded away. Um, and so this is a major unknown and it undermines our achieving the goal of herd immunity. Did the virus mutate? We don't know without doing genet genetic sequencing. And that test is a little bit more uh, expensive. Now there's another life cycle. Uh, a friend of mine works in the ICU, uh, ICU nurse and boy is she stressed out. Uh, she had a patient that came in, uh, was in the ICU on the ventilator for a while, somehow recovered, went home and three months later died uh, from organ failure. And this is being seen more and more often. So even if you walk out of the hospital uh, after uh, a severe infection, uh, you may not be out of the woods. Now, the, uh, and, uh, the uh, original tests, putting the swab up your nose, had a, a quality issue. Uh, in a perfect world, if it's present, if it's present, the test should be positive. If the virus is absent, the test should be negative. But there are false positives, uh, depending on the kind of test. But what's more worrisome is there are false negatives. These people think they are okay, but they're not. They go around spreading the virus. I love this photograph. We would not see this today. But I saw an excellent video on the JAMA 
a, a website where Michael Osterholm, and he's one of the experts in this, said that the rapid detection test used at the White House back, oh, six months ago, nine months ago, gives quick results, but a high rate of false negatives. So it's not very uh, reliable in uh, telling us what's going on. <laughs> now, when, when infected, the Viron count has a curve something like this. Uh, and uh, the antibody count kicks in a little bit when there are enough virons to trigger the human immune system. And so these antibodies eventually kill off the virons, and that, uh, that, that count will eventually go to zero. Uh, the test sensitivity is an issue. For example, with that viron count curve looking like that, um, a low sensitivity test with quick results has a very high threshold. It needs a lot of virons to trigger and give it a, a positive test. So uh, in the period of time before the viron count is high enough, it's going to have false negatives. Whereas a high sensitivity test has a lower threshold, but still for the first two days, it's going to give false negatives. So it's a, a no test is absolutely perfect. I uh, hear a lot of, uh, from the start of the pandemic, we heard about cases, and these are infections. And I found myself yelling at the TV screen, what was the denominator? What, how many cases, how many tests did you do to yield that number of cases? And so to illustrate that problem, uh, let's just say we had three different groups that we ran tests on and we got 15 positive with patients with symptoms. And then we got 40 positive uh, with a group of at-risk hospital workers. And if you remember back in April and May, those were the people we were doing the testing. And then we had voluntary drive-through testing. Let's just say we got 20. So in the county, we have a total of 75 cases that are reported up the data chain to the state health department and the CDC. Well, I want to know what the sample size is. And in the uh, patients with symptoms, uh, the sample size yielded a positivity rate of 75%. Uh, in the uh, at-risk hospital workers, we had uh, uh, 8%. And in the drive-through testing of self-selected people, it was only 2.5%. So in reality, the... Uh, Actually, it's the 2.5% uh, rate that I would consider more significant. The ideal situation is for public health officials to conduct a random sample of the community. And let's say we got 25, we did 2,000 tests and we got 25 positives. That's a 1.25 rate of positivity. If we multiply that times the half million people in the county, we would estimate that there are 6,250 people in the county with infections countywide. Unfortunately, we don't know who the other 6,000 people are, and they don't know that they are who they are. They don't know they're infected and contagious. And then there's the delay of data gathering and aggregation. So the funeral homes and the hospitals report to the county health department. There are 3,000 counties doing that in the U.S. That may be reported to the uh, state health department, but it also may be reported to the CDC. The CDC passes its numbers to Johns Hopkins, and that's for many months. The, the media, uh, the news media, went to the Johns Hopkins uh, website to uh, to get their uh, statistics. So th this is what I call the data to information supply chain. On the left, we have raw data. On the right end, we have meaningful information. Got to talk about comorbidity, a medical condition existing simultaneously, but independently with another condition in a patient. And so for you data modelers, cause of death is a multivalued attribute. And so if we look at a uh, certificate of death, and this comes from the state of Utah, and there is provision 
for three different causes of death. Uh, they can be chained together or they can be simultaneous. And so when somebody dies and they are declared death, either by a, a ambulance driver or a physician, there may or may not be an autopsy on the body, which uh, results in blood tests and tissue examination. And eventually a medical examiner, coroner, will uh, finish the test and fill out a, a death certificate. And uh, But there could be some delay in that death certificate. So that's why we have some delay in, uh, in reporting the number of deaths uh, to the CDC. So if we had a situation where COVID-19 was clearly one of the cause of deaths for a patient that had these uh, pre-existing conditions, then an argument ensues. And here's where it gets political. Should this be included in the COVID-19 death count? Uh, some would argue, no, they would have died anyway. Others would argue, yes, but they could have lived longer without COVID-19. And so that no argument is used as an excuse by some politicians for underreporting or underestimating the death total. So basically, you cannot manage a public health situation without metrics. And so we test for two reasons, on the macro scale to get the big picture and to conduct a public health management. On the micro scale, to alert the individual who may be contagious and advise quarantine and contact tracing. Both reasons save lives. Early on, we heard about flattening the curve, and this was one of the uh, reasons why we wanted to shut down the economy. Uh, the, the flattening the curve doesn't necessarily reduce the total number of deaths. Getting everybody vaccinated does. But, but it, uh, flattening the curve, the area under the curves, the two curves are the same. It just spreads out the load, workload for the hospital and regulates the number of cases so they don't overwhelm the emergency room or the ICU. What would reduce the total number of deaths? high volume of random testing frequently and, of course, subsidized. I think we're pretty much on top of that. Rigorous and aggressive contact tracing. Uh, I haven't heard much chatter about that. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, selective quarantine. You can tell someone they're infected, but will they quarantine? Uh, people who deny uh, the, the existence of the virus uh, will probably not quarantine and go ahead and infect and possibly kill other people. Encouraging protective behavior. Here is a man who would have difficulty social distancing. I, uh, when I spoke at the DEMA uh, conference in, a, uh, uh, where is it, Austin, Texas, I took an afternoon to go to the LBJ library and I saw this photo up on the third floor. I like, this is typical of a very assertive, politician. Uh, the stages of patient status and events, uh, it, it can go something like this. A person can be tested. If they test negative, great. If they test positive, then uh, uh, they may or may not have symptoms. If they do show symptoms, even some people never tested show symptoms. They may recover or they have to go into the hospital. Some who are hospitalized may just get a mild case and walk out. Others have to go to the ICU. Some in the ICU recover and some in the ICU dead die. But we also discovered that there were a lot of folk, uh, elderly folk in New York who never uh, left their apartment and just died in their apartment, but they had been, uh, they had been infected. So this raises all kinds of questions about public health management. How soon afterwards should we test a person who tested negative? Uh, if they test positive, how do we monitor their symptoms? And if they recover, the big question is, are they still infectious? Could they develop symptoms later? Or could they become a long hauler? And it's the long haulers that be, be, become a, a, a new problem. But first, 
when we use the word risks or odds, there's risk of being infected. There's risk of getting sick. There's risk of infecting others. There's risk of being hospitalized, even smaller risk of going on a ventilator, and you do not want to do that. Uh, and there's a risk of death. Each of these has a distinct per percentage along with long haul symptoms. So before, uh, before the vaccine, there was a certain uh, percentage of risk on each of these. Uh, and after the vaccine, hopefully on all of these, the percentage of risk should go lower. But when you enter a new uh, or experience a new mutation, like the B117 coming out of the UK, all these odds change. And so we have to express the risk uh, in context of the whole situation. Now, uh, the, the, the metrics rep reported in the press were just the number of cases and the number of deaths. And I've already said that cases without knowing the denominator is, uh, is not as helpful as it should be. My ideal situation is to have metrics on every stage. And some states are doing this in their public health department. Many of these metrics have a daily and cumulative nature and they could be used to calculate the trends and ratios and the odds of moving on to the next step, uh, in other words, the risk. But the problem is that capturing these additional metrics is work, costs money for the health agencies, hospitals, and, and, and data integrators, and what motivates them to do this correctly. And here is a classical data quality issue. When humans are involved in capturing data points and facts, what motivates them to do it correctly? That's a whole hour long topic. Uh, the trade-off between burden and benefit is something that gets argued over quite a bit. And then we have the long haulers and a, approximately 2.2% of the people who were hospitalized uh, are uh, experienced long haul symptoms. And uh, they're mostly young, they're mostly female, which introduces a, another cultural uh, challenge for healthcare. Uh, over 100 ki kinds of lingering symptoms, and I'm not going to read all these. Uh, 40 to 60% to of hospitalized victim victims experience neurological symptoms, and 74% had persistent symptoms, fatigue, shortness of breath, up to 12 weeks after discharge. So how do we gather and post data on this phenomenon? So, uh, and of course it's more complicated than this. And here I'll go into very briefly, uh, very quickly, uh, some of the elements of the data model for a hospital a clinical system for a hospital. And we have uh, kernel stable entities, we have episodes, and we have uh, events. And we should understand the difference between these. And beyond this level of detail, proprietary EMR architectures differ. Uh, uh, illnesses are not mutually exclusive time-wise, so the patient can have multiple episodes of the same disease or multiple diseases at, at the same time. Uh, they can be hospitalized in multiple episodes, but generally a hospitalization uh, uh, and hospitalizations are mutually exclusive. So uh, a patient can have two hospitalizations. There are distinct events of when they're diagnosed, admitted, sent home, readmitted. And so uh, Within the hospitalization experience, there could be different unit assignments. As they get worse, they're moved up to the ICU. So we would see that, um, that uh, episode as a distinct kind of episode. And there are events marking the ch change from condition to condition. Uh, so the unit assignment is a sub-episode. Uh, and then the treatment uh, is a part of a regimen. Uh, so there are treatment events that occur at, at a particular point in time. Uh, there are medical tests. They are generally events that 
occur in a particular point of time as are diagnoses. So those are some of the essential uh, subject entities in a, uh, in a uh, EMR database. Uh, which of the patient's medical events should be reported externally? And again, there's a trade-off between the value to the physicians and the public health management versus the cost of reporting. So uh, <laughs> for many diseases, the typical trajectory was you get well, you, uh, the symptoms abate over time. And so generally, uh, most health professionals don't track that. Once you're discharged, you're, uh, they, don't, they don't call you up a, a week later. At least my doctor doesn't call me up and say, how are you? Doesn't happen in, in this environment. Uh, but uh, with long haul lingering symptoms, a big question is how do you digitize this curve or express it as a metric? Um, and part of the problem with particularly the cognitive fade in long haul is that uh, uh, there aren't many objective metrics for it. Yet the patient may be so sick that they can't go to work and they lose their job. And that's happening an awful lot. So can an EMR database contain pa patient conditions not observed or confirmed by a medical professional? That's kind of like crowdsourcing data. Can, are we willing to do that? There's no formalized name for the wrong hole, no ICD-10 code for it. Hence, it's not recognized. And this is the frustration. There, these people can't get state disability because there's no <coughs> confirmed uh, code for the long haul symptoms. So the medical community must uh, recognize it. And the shape of these symptoms can change. There's all kinds of shapes. How do we capture those shapes in a consistent way in the EMR database? Uh, and so that we can aggregate the characteristics for predictive purposes. So the, this creates some new database design implications. Uh, are the characteristics of COVID, I'm gonna skip over this because I'm watching the clock. Um, these are some of the, uh, if we were in the same room, I'd throw these out and we could have a discussion. But I wanna talk a little bit about the vaccine there are issues of effectiveness. Does it prevent infections? Does it trigger antibodies to the threat? And uh, do those antibodies stick around for a while? And is it safe? Are there minimum immediate side effects and no long-term consequences? Uh, a typical development life cycle for a vaccine takes a number of years. I want you particularly to look at phase two where they uh, do trials for safety and immunity. Typically, that takes two to three years. We are dealing with vaccines that were warp speed developed. There are over 178 distinct vaccines under development uh, in five categories. I'm not going to go through that. But at the current uh, time, of all the pharma, big pharma companies, uh, these four have uh, developed vaccines that have gotten emergency approval. There are all kinds of potential side effects, which is why you want a large sample in your trial to uh, catch these uh, side effects that may have a very low uh, frequency. Uh, you want the sample size large enough. And then there's the issue of safety. Uh, is uh, now, for example, I got, when I was a kid, I got the polio vaccine. That's been around for 60 years. We have pretty much absolute confidence uh, in the of the polio vaccine. Uh, there's been no uh, discussion to the, uh, to the contrary. Now, the efficacy of a vaccine for COVID-19 uh, will, will rise uh, a few days after the injection. So you're st you still have, ha have to be careful and wear your mask and do all the distancing. And then the efficacy becomes flat and may de decline uh, 
uh, after a, a period of time. But we don't know because it's too soon to tell. We have not had enough experience over time with these vaccines. Uh, so there, uh, one way I would graph it is a range of uncertainty that, that looks something like that. But we could have two different vaccines with two different characteristics uh, of eff efficacy and lasting power. And uh, uh, when, when this occurs and when we have this kind of data, and we don't have it yet, uh, then would we allow the patient or the consumer to choose between the two vaccines? Well, time will tell, but we can't wait. So the future, uh, the vaccine efficacy may fade. We may have to have booster shots. Uh, the virus may mutate and then all bets are off because uh, we, we're gonna have to develop new vaccines. But uh, fortunately, the manufacturing and uh, technology and resources are in place. So a uh, vaccine efficacy, what we do know about the Wuhan strain is that Pfizer is 95% and Moderna is 94%. At least those were the original statistics. But we don't know the efficacy against some of these other strains. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is the campus of Loma Linda University. We have this very large hospital. We have 17,000 employees. We see a million patients a year. And for some of the employees, uh, particularly the nurses of childbearing years, it has been tough to persuade them to get the shot. I, I had no uh, hesitation once all my friends walked back and seemed to be alive to me. So, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, being a health sciences uh, university, the employees had uh, a priority. There are new risks. Uh, the original antibody can destroy the original version of COVID-19, but with a, a second uh, or version, a mutation, uh, new cases will, are causing a surge in the UK. Will the antibodies developed uh, attack the mutation? Or a third mutation, will the antibodies attack that? That's why we, we have to continue to gather data. And the matrix gets to be uh, a little bit more complex. With each mutation, we have new statistics on symptom severity, reinfection, and the long haul characteristics. Are we ready for the next pandemic? I don't think so. Uh, the public health infrastructure in America has been severely underfunded for the past few years. And uh, so that's, that's a major question. Uh, and what else could come down the pike? And I'm see we're at 42 minutes. Uh, lots, we know about a lot of diseases, but there are cultural biases undermining data quality. And I've worked in, in a number of organizations where if the data uh, doesn't confirm uh, the executive's expectation, he may say, don't capture that metric or don't report that metric, or they may cook the numbers. Now, here's an excellent example of pol politicians cooking the numbers. <coughs> the, these are uh, daily clusters of the, uh, the, the four, five colored bars or the five counties in the Atlanta metropolitan area. And they published this on the Georgia Department of Public Health website. And you'd have to look carefully to notice that they sequenced the days, not in chronological order, but in order to convey the impression that the number of cases was going down. This was a deliberate misrepresentation of reality, implying a downward trend. So the situation, uh, the challenges we have, highly distrib distributed data gathering and reporting, Inconsistent timing of aggregations leads to highly volatile metrics. We saw that. There are occasional ambiguities in the cause of death. We discussed that. And retroactive collection of some uh, statistics, uh, some stats uh, are, are retroactively uh, restated uh, by some reporting mechanisms. And the mutation of the virus complicates testing. And so the key takeaways. We have to consider statistics carefully. 
uh, the face value of what a reporter is saying may not be accurate. When cases are cited, we need to ask, what's the denominator? How big was the sample? And how representative is the sample? In any aggregate of cases or deaths, we need to ask, are all the constituent parts reporting? In a state total, did uh, uh, a third of the counties not report this morning? Uh, we have to properly normalize the statistics, such as showing the rate of deaths per 100,000 population. That allows us to compare large countries with small countries. Uh, and so that's basically uh, the end. And I see we have six minutes for, uh, for uh, discussion. And I got to figure out how to unshare my screen unless you. Oh, you're are, okay, but, Michael. You got it. Thank you. Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, thank you for that great presentation, by the way. Okay. Um, the first question is Are there any current organized efforts out there to improve the quality of COVID 19 data, such as definitions, data models, timeliness, et cetera? Yeah, there are. Um, uh, uh, the previous hour in this conference, uh, uh, one speaker told about what they're doing for the state of California Public Health Department and creating a dashboard to report the cases or to report all the metrics. And, and there are increasing number of metrics, hospital admissions, uh, uh, ICU admissions. What, uh, our hospital across the street uh, what was it? Five weeks ago, we had 230 COVID-19 patients. Right now, we're down to 20. That is an amazing volatility. Uh, but but there are there are efforts. I think a lot of people, uh, and I think the CDC is being taken more seriously now than it was three months ago, and and they are being given the resources to improve the the statistic reporting. I great. hope that answered that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, let's see, what do we have? What percentage of the people in you think have the health literacy to understand many of the ideas you describe? And <laughs> how can we improve the health literacy of the gen general public? Do you see why I use pictures? <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't, don't, uh, don't understand this. And uh, I, I think it's part of the dumbing America, but uh, uh, health literacy is a big issue and, and that's worth talking about, but I don't have a neat solution to it. Great. Um, then we've got, let me see. Do you think this pandemic will trigger a digital transformation in this pandemic management sector? I think it will now, yeah. Uh, I think uh, once the death rate sinks in, and there's still a lot of denial about it, or just ignoring the fact that you have bodies dropping all over, once that sinks in, I think politicians are going to be uh, interested in better funding public health. Uh, and the broad public health includes uh, uh, record keeping, uh, tr uh, tracking, and surveillance. So uh, we should we should have had people on the ground in China to to uh, give an early warning that something was coming. And there, that's a whole other topic of of surveillance. We did have some people, but uh, not as many as we needed. Great, thank you. And we've got about one minute left, so we're going to do one more question. Um, what do you think was the biggest lesson learned from this past year that we can prepare for before the next pandemic in terms of gathering and defining data? And that's, you know, some of the stuff you've talked about. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think, well, first of all, testing uh, the, one of the important, we know when people die, but we did until we had a, a high volume of testing, we didn't know when they were inf infectious. So that's, that's a, an important uh, data gathering. But there, there's got to be more respect for science and respect for expertise 
and, uh, and to, to take uh, this kind of thing seriously. And that respect has to grow in uh, the politicians as well as the general public. I'm getting a little political there, but uh, that's what I feel. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so that's it for today. Thank you, Michael, for this great presentation. And thanks to all of our attendees for tuning in. Please How complete many did your. We, have? Uh, we were up to, I think, over 30 or so at one point. Okay. We, it kind of curious. goes up and down. Yeah, it was kind I of understand. goes up and down. Yeah. You know, um, but I think we had a lot of good questions today. Good. Um, to everyone, please complete your, consent, your conference session survey at the bottom of this page for this session. And the next session, and actually the last session for the day, will start in about 10 minutes. And Michael, thank you very much, and you have a good rest of your day. Take care.